So the night we're loading this boat, we're unloading this boat, and I'm bringing half into Pine Island, and I got another boat headed to Everglades City. All oh, hell breaks loose. Here comes cops out of everywhere. I mean, cars coming down the road. I could hear like 50 vehicles coming down the road, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. There should be nobody out here. Right. And all of a sudden, here they come out of nowhere. And hey, this is Matt Cox, and we're going to go podcast on its well so this is tim mcbride but he wrote a book called uh called saltwater uh cowboy and um it's it's funny because every time i, I mention it to somebody i always say you know like cocaine cowboys but it's really not cocaine cowboys no, it's but not. you know but you know but you threw co cowboy in there so the it's the immediate you know and it's it's the drug thing but it's not right. like the it, it's funny because like Colby hasn't seen um, I always point at Colby he's he's never he never like he doesn't know who DB Cooper is oh. he does, like, there's just all these things that I'm always being, I'll say something and you can look on his face you know he's like you know huh? but he's in his what? early twenty years in his right. what mid twenties yeah yeah so oh, that's forgivable right yeah, totally so um, and then of course then later he's like he now say he came back and suddenly there are all these cultural like references that he's like now i realize right. you know who this, neil armstrong this. is right, so, right. Yeah, okay <laughs> so he uh um but i and same thing I, I was like he's like okay so what's the story and i was like well it's you know i immediately said you know cocaine cowboys and he was like i've heard of it but he's never saw it saw it but the problem is it's not even comparable because that whole thing it's well, a, you know what is comparable though the only thing i said what is comparable is kind of how like they say that Miami was kind of built on the drugs that were coming in from those for, at that time. But the town you're from that we're going to be talking about, like that whole town, which is only a small part of it, but right. that whole town, like even the guys that where they were saying like one in three or one in five guys were involved. But the truth is, yeah, but the other two other, the other two people are, you know, making a, running a restaurant that's solely supported or the bulk of the support for that restaurant is from these these drug smugglers or houses that are being built and sold are from the drugs. Guys right. fixing the mechanics, you know, the guys selling cars, the guys right. putting on roofs, the guys selling insurance, like everybody's one way or another. They're all based on that. And whether someone, you're actually involved hands on. You're involved in one fashion. In some right? way or another, you're benefiting from it. You're a, so, you're a member of the community, and you know and that makes you part of you know whatever that community history is you know involving right. you in, whether you like it or not. Right. Well, so we're gonna so we're gonna talk about the your story. I mean, you've written a book, but you know, uh, Saltwater Cowboys, right. and um, but we're gonna talk about the actual story. And basically, the the story kind of spans what from the seventies eight seventies. Through the 70s and mid up to the mid 80s, would right. you say? My my particular story um, begins in the late 70s and runs through the late 80s. Right. Um, the the story itself at times goes back to the beginning, which was the 60s, early 60s, mid 60s, when uh, the original pot holler, um, right. Lauren Toch Brown, was his name. Um, very cool guy. It is what is who started it all actually so right but i don't go too much into detail on that because it's of course it's my story right i was gonna say you know, so and, and it's not a statistical boring romp through the war on drugs this is just me hanging out with you telling you my story yeah. man That's well you know i've always said like if you take 10 years of anybody's life and you condense it into 300 pages or less than 300 pages and write it correctly even if it's some guy working, you know, at Walmart, you're probably going to get a pretty good story. Right. And, you know, if you throw in, yeah, but this is a whole town and this is a, a drug kind of a, a whole industry and there's investigations and there's all, you know, there's money involved and illegal smuggling and all this other, and you condense it into less than 300 pages. Well, then you've got an amazing story. But right. so I was going to say, so, but let's start like, where where was you, where were you born? Because you weren't born in Florida. No, you weren't raised I, in Florida. I was born in North Carolina. Actually, I was um, my father was 82nd Airborne okay. out, of, out of North Carolina, Fort Bragg. So I was born in North Carolina, um, raised there. Um, he moved a bit to the Midwest after he you know, had gotten out of the uh, the paratroopers. Right. I took a sales job in the Midwest. <laughs> well, or, or, and or um, there you go. It's okay. I know it seems weird, bro, but Be. otherwise. <laughs> 
<clears throat> but um, yeah, I took a job in the Midwest, sales job, and you know, and what have you, and that's where I wound up doing my four years of high school, and uh, was pretty much not a stick around kind of guy. You know, I wasn't the go with the flow. I was the you know, follow me, I don't follow you kind of thing going on there. And um, I was always also if was the kind of guy if something better or seemed better came along, I just went. Right. You know, I wasn't that guy that stood back and said, you know, they, you know, years from now, I'm going to kick myself in the ass saying, I wish I should have done that. Right. You know, I just did it. So that's kind of how I wound up, you know, going through this bit of a force gump, if you will, <laughs> ride that I took. Right. Um, just, you know, nothing really um, dysfunctional going on in the family that caused me to become an outlaw or a, or a smuggler or a pot hauler or what I would, whatever you choose to call me. But... You know, it was just a very particular sequence of events took place, and there I was, right in the middle of it. But so, uh, came well, from came from North Carolina to the Midwest. Did a bit of time out in out in um, out in LA working, um, and, and this is a little short um, chapter in here about working for Sammy Davis Jr. for uh, for about a year and a half or two. Doing what? Um, I was actually doing so his. Do you know who Sammy Davis Jr. is? <laughs> He's You're part of the Rat Pack. Rat Pack, right? man. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of asthma thing going on. It was on, like, like, he's, like, he's a, a black guy, but this is, and he was a black guy and an actor in a time when there were no real black actors. Dude. And he was a part of this, you know, these, this group of guys. Like, um, Mega entertainer, dude. Right. I mean, um, Las Vegas strip, big time. Yeah. Him and uh, Sammy Davis Sammy Jr. Davis, well, it was, I'm sorry, Sammy, it was, Sammy Davis Jr. was, um, um, gosh, I just went blank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, who's Sinatra. Uh, yeah, Sinatra. I was going to say New York, New York, uh, Sinatra. Yeah. And um, uh, Dean Martin. Was it Rock Hudson, too? Was he a no, part of it at one point? No, Rock wasn't part of that. Because there was like four guys. No, it was Dean Martin, um, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, Joey. Anyways, but anyways, um, yeah, it was all part of that game, right? Man. And you know, it was a cool time in my life, you know. But it wasn't uh, something I was really, you know, digging at that time. So I, you know, I kind of yawned and I went back. I went back to Wisconsin, you know, to you know, back home for a. You know, right. I wasn't there a week, and then a buddy of mine, you know, that I grew up next to, called me up from Milwaukee and said, "Dude, I'm, I'm going to Florida tomorrow." You know, my brother-in-law runs a fish house down on this little island called Chukaluski and and uh I'm gonna go down there and hang out with my sister and and, and my brother-in-law and work on a work on a crab boat you want to go <laughs> I said sure why not right so uh I just you know stopped dropped everything I was doing packed everything in my Mustang and off I went wound up uh you know a couple of days later at the dead end of US 40 or 29 right on uh, Chukaluski Island okay and that's uh, and that's on the, is that below Fort Myers, a little bit below Fort Myers? Yeah, it's way below. Actually, it's the last bit of a, it's the last settlement on the on the southwest coast before you said you, okay. you head east to uh, to Miami. Okay. Um, yeah, the only other thing south of uh, Everglades City would be the Ranger Station at Flamingo, which is in the heart of the Everglades. Okay. But. Um, yeah, there's Everglades City, which is uh, um, a little island in of itself, and Chukaluski, so they're both connected by causeway, two little islands. Right. What's the, the area called, isn't it? Is that the... That's the 10,000 Islands. Okay. Uh, it's actually on the north, uh, the northwest, cor very northwest corner of the Everglades National Park. And we were one of the islands within the 10,000 Islands, which is, you know, right on these borders of the National Park. Okay. And uh, which was... Um, and if you've seen an aerial, if you ever, you know, Google it, you know, and get an aerial view of what the 10,000 Islands literally looks like, it's, it's 10,000 Islands, man. Tiny. Some of them are just, Dude, they're just only specks. a few feet, and some of them are fairly large. That's right. right. And this is where me and my buddies played. You know, we hung out. We, you know, we we could lose you in a heartbeat out there, man. You know, right. which we got, we got you in there. We would lose you. You were done for unless we come and got you. That was just as simple as that. One of my, uh, actually one of my best buddies at the time, um, RD, we called him Ranger Dave. He was, uh, he was at the time, you know, playing part of the crew, but he was national park ranger at the same time. But his job literally was going out and, you know, search and rescue. 
people in canoes that get out there and start paddling around, not understanding that there's tides and there's, you know, you know all these islands and back one. You can be, you know, on this side of the island and town on the other side of the island and you have no idea what you right. are. One of those kind of things, which made it perfect for what it was we wanted to, you know. Right. So how long before you start realizing that you were involved in a, an act, actually not, <laughs> not, you were actually involved in not <laughs> grabbing or you were actually involved in a, in a smuggling operation? Well, I, I was invited down, um, not just to go, not to go fishing. Actually, um, his, my buddy's uh, sister and brother-in-law were building our home on the island at the time. I came down just to help, you know, just to do something, have a job when I got here. So I was helping to build the house. Okay. Mark, uh, my buddy, was already working on the boat with another guy from Michigan. So there's a captain and there's two crewmen on the boat typically. Well, um, I'm building this house, and they really don't want this guy from Michigan on the boat. They want people you know that they know and they knew us and when you come into a place like this um you know the 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 typical greeting is you know nobody wants to know you man you know who who are you you know know, come and go you know that kind of that kind of atmosphere because what's a close net to the nature of what's going on very close net nobody wants to know anybody else you know and if you come into town you don't belong there we know you're there you know that kind of thing we so used, um, I think it was what four, less than five hundred people or something like that. At that time, at that it was time. just yeah, just under five hundred people. And um, the guy from Michigan, and you know, in these positions working on this boat, and the work's a bitch, man. I mean, it's hard because right. we're moving, you know, at, at at the at the height of our our pulling, you know, pulling traps in our season, we were pulling seven hundred traps a day, and they average between you know. 60 70 pounds a piece these things you know and it, it'll make a big boy out of you right so um what the captain did uh, at that time while i was helping finishing up building his uh building the house was um and they worked this guy to death man until he, he couldn't take it anymore so he just quit <laughs> so once he quit they said timmy come on you know get on board you know come work on the boat so i came jumped on the boat so that very first morning i had a bit of an idea i was i was tutored in a way about how it worked you know you get on the boat in the middle of the night, like three in the morning, and it takes you two, three hours sometimes to get to where you're going to pull traps. Right. And as soon as the sun comes up and you're able to see the first buoy, you start reaching out there. We have a, a catch pole. You've seen Delia's catch. I was just, I was just thinking. I, I've, I've watched this for years. These guys in prison when I was locked up, just year after year, they love that show. Yeah, very similar to that. Right. In, in, in the way it works, um, we don't have the, the grapple in the line that you toss. Right. We, our buoys are. We only have the one buoy that's only this big. They have a double bag system because they throw between the bags in order to grab the, the line. Right. You know. Uh, and they're using, you know, sometimes 800 feet of rope and a thousand pound trap. Ours is um, three eighths inch nylon trap line. And you can literally, uh, we fashion our own catch pole, they're called. I use a shark hook that I grind the barb off of. And um, I would fashion it to the to a piece of one by lathing and, and, you know, and just reach out there, grab the buoy, pull it in through the block. And that thing that you see spinning, yeah. that they put the rope into that's called a shiv right and the way that's designed is this like two pie plates together like this and when you put the rope in there it cinches the rope between these two pieces and it's spinning but as it's spinning there's another piece down below called the knife it's not really not a knife but what it does is it kicks the rope back out so it doesn't continue to wrap around it then it goes into their coiler and blah 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 like that very very similar so we're out there doing this and, you know, we're pulling traps and um, I knew that you'd get up early, you know, crack of dawn. Well, I get up and it's like, you know, the sun's up and the bunks are right in the wheelhouse. And I lean out of the bunk and I'm looking up at Billy, he's the captain. I said, and he looks at me, he's got this big shitty grin on his face, man. He goes, he goes, Timmy, we're not going to, we're not going to pull traps today. He says, we're going to um, hang out off, you know, out here and screw around all day and unload a pot boat from Columbia tonight and I said okay cool (laughs) and that's how they got me because it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek sort of an affair but they knew me you know and you know we all smoked weed at that time we're all kids and shit so they knew I'd be okay with it so um, we hung out there all that day the first time I ever worked on that boat my first day working on that boat to go scone crabbing was uh, unloading a pot boat from Columbia 15 tons is what was on it that night. And I 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's a lot of pot. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a good load. Yeah, uh, when you first see it, you know, for the first time, because you know, up until this point, you hear about little rumors and you know, and the little little ghost things that are going on. But now, I'm I'm one of the ghosts, and so it's it's real. What does a bale weigh? Like fifty pounds uh, that you're pulling? Typically, but- well, see, here's something that that. Um, you know, a, a lot of people, I mean, most people, almost everyone is not aware of. Um, the way a bale of, of uh, pot looks today, um, they're kind of a bit of rectangular shaped. I'll show you. I'll show you a picture of one here. Um, packed rather well. Um, they have, uh, let's see, where'd it go? Here we go. Yeah, like, like that. Yeah, that's what a typical bale looks like, and they average yeah. when you're when you're getting them that consistent. They're averaging, you know, seventy pounds. Okay, now ish, ish. No. but not then. No, 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 not then. What was happening then in those early days uh, when I first began in the in the late sixties or, or um, late late seventies, um, they were loading what we called pillow bales. And it was quite literally looked like someone was taking a plastic bag and, and stuffing it with their foot like this as much as they could get into the damn thing, tape it shut with duct tape, stick that into a burlap sack, stitch that one shut. So now you're getting, you know, you're getting bales that are they're not consistent, they're not square, they're not round, you know, they're they're anywhere from 30 to 110 pounds, you know, because they're just putting in them whatever they can put them into. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Um, our job, as you know, going offshore and unloading these freighters, you know, we were, our job was to just not just to pull our boat out there and wait for the shit to come raining down on our boat. We'd have to get up on these freighters, these ships sometimes, and help the crew bring it up on deck. Right. And then throw it overboard and start loading it, you know, give them a hand, then they would toss it down to us because these boats stay running. And as a kid, you know, Jesus, I've been on, I've been on boats that have had as much as, I don't know, three, 400,000 pounds on them at a time. And we would go back a couple, two, three nights in a row and unload them. Right. You know, and, and the stuff down below, it, it, it gets like a mulch pile gets that gets, it starts to self combust. It gets warm, it gets hot and it's hot as shit down there, man. So, you can only stay down there for so long. You're taking your turn back and forth. But as you're doing this, by the time we got these bales, you know, from the mothership, they'd probably been handled maybe two, maybe three times already. And they're starting to come apart. Right. So we're tossing stuff and I got shake in my hair and I'm looking over at my buddy. I'm laughing. I wrote about this in the book and he's got seeds like, a, you know, mcdonald's hamburger bun stuck all over his face and i'm just cracking up because it's just you know we're just covered with this shit and um long story short as far as that goes um we would take this stuff back to shore the other boats typically how it works we'd load our big boat our crab boat which is um that right there right. i mean just see the radar yeah. From from just so the radar can turn all the way back, load it all the way back. I mean, this thing at 30,000 pounds of shit on this. You, and it looked like from above, all you could see was the radar turning. It looked like a big mound of pot moving through the water. <laughs> you couldn't even see the boat. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so. We should get that picture. Yeah, I could. Yeah, yeah, we get that picture. You probably put it up. Like, you could probably put up the picture somewhere. Yeah. Just real quick. Just it's, it's actually... Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can send it to you. But I have. Let's see. There's a. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. There's a bigger yeah. picture of it right there. But see, I mean, this thing is just loaded. See where the water line is? Yeah. We would load it till there was about seven inches of water line. <laughs> I mean, dangerously yeah. loaded. Yeah. But um, w- what was going on was um, we would take this stuff into shore give it off to the smaller boats that can go through the shallows. Right. And at that time, and it was always done this way, we would put the load in, uh, take it to the island and put it in one of our friend's houses that we've literally taken all the furniture out of. 
and you start in the back of the house, you can do the bedrooms and the bathrooms and the, you know, the dining room and the living room. I mean, floor to ceiling. And if the house is full and there's still some more coming, well, you just pull the door shut and go to Teddy's house next door, <laughs> start loading that one. All right. You know, but here we've got this, this stuff that's just coming apart. I mean, they're not all falling apart, but it's nasty. Now, once our big boat is unloaded and everybody's taking this stuff to the houses, our job, we go offshore and we clean up and, you know, we scrub down and this and that. And then we, you know, we bunk down for the night near one of our trap lines and we start pulling traps the next day, you know, just like going back to work again. Right. So if you're the DEA taking photos, you went out, you came back with traps. And it's not uncommon for a boat to stay out and do do a two-day trip or, you know, something like that, depending on how far they have to go. Um, But uh, more to the point is... The, the shit was so nasty. I mean, we would take hours of, of you know, screwdrivers and knives and little corners and shit. And, and finally, we decided that, you know, we're, we're, I literally was, just, we were sweeping this stuff into piles on the deck of the boat and taking an ice shovel and shoveling it off the boat. That's how thick this stuff was. I mean, I, I emptied more shit out of my fishing boots than most two, three guys could smoke in their lifetime. It was just nasty. Right. So the, uh, the first two generations, we were, we were third generation. We were the kids. The first two generations ultimately got their heads together and said, look, man, you know, they were, we were responsible for this shit once we take it off your boat. You know, and if there's anything goes wrong out here between now and the time that we get it to you, we're screwed. Right. You know, one seat on that boat, if anything becomes suspect, they find one seat on our boat, we're done. So a couple of the older generations took it upon themselves at that time here in the early 80s when the advent of the uh, commercial and the household trash compactor started coming onto the scene. They said, hey, look here. So they take a couple dozen of those things down to South America and said, look, here's what we need you to do. (laughs) So now they've got a bank of generators going. And how they were doing it was, I mean, the stuff would come in by mule from wherever it's coming. And we were unloading mountain sides of this stuff, dude. I was taking, um, by the time I got to go, uh, flying to Columbia and buying myself, I'm buying 100, 200,000 pounds at a time. And I'm sending boats to go get the stuff, you know, as many as I can, you know, as quick as I can go get it done. But we were just unloading this stuff, you know, as quick as we can, as quick, you know, as quick as we could. But now they're all coming more uniformly. Right. And the, the boats that we're using, the crab boats, by, um, uh, by their very nature, they're perfectly designed for hauling bales of pot because they're designed for hauling traps. Right. <laughs> so now the loads not only got more organized, but they got bigger because now they're more compacted. Right. So now we're getting more weight. So they're the heavier. Too. I was going to say they're heavier too, they're right? Heavier so now. now they're more squares, they're, right? They're rectangles. They're easier to, easier somewhat to hold on to, you know, and like that. But um, this is the evolution of the bale of pot. People, people see a bale of pot and what it looks like today. This is the result of that. Right. Of, of the, you know, the, the whole compacting idea of it all. Because it was just insane, ludicrous the way it was happening. But it cleaned up. It got quicker. We didn't have to, you know, we could get in. We could get out. The houses could get loaded. People could get, you know, that shit could get to Miami a lot quicker. It just, you know, sped the whole thing up. Is that where everything's going to Miami or is it going all over? At that time, what we were doing, we were what the, the, uh, the United States government described as service providers. We were the ones that actually doing the work. You right. would, um, for instance, you give me, it, you know, when I started, you know, doing my thing, uh, weed in, in uh, South America and Colombia was going for $10 a pound at that time. You give me 300, th- it, I mean, cocaine cowboys in Miami, they just got money to play with. They got nothing better to do. So, you know, give me $300,000 of your bar money and I'll buy you 30,000 pounds of weed. Right. Well, you take that 30,000 pounds of weed that I just paid $10 a pound for and between 8 and 14, 15 days or so, depending on any any, um, weather events coming through the Caribbean or the lower Caribbean, I can get that load from South America to to South Florida in that amount of days. Well, I've just turned this guy's $300,000 into nearly 15 million because now it's not worth $10 a pound. It's worth $500 a pound or close to it. So I'm taking this guy's 300 grand 
And in the eight days, I'm, I'm returning him $9,700,000 because out of that comes my fee. If it's 30000 you owe me $5 million, I take $5 million, I owe you ten. Okay. You paid 300000 for this. You just made $9,700,000 in eight days. You think these fuckers are shooting at me? Hell no, man. They're giving me more money. Go back, get some more. Get, I couldn't get it fast enough. That's just how it was. I mean, and if you take the math and you do it a little bit further, it becomes it, it becomes an astronomical figure. It becomes really ridiculous. Right. In in in, in the fact that if I'm doing this with three hundred thousand dollars, okay, and I'm making nine million seven hundred thousand. Take that. Let me. I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up. I want to do this right. If you, <laughs> if you take that. Nine million. 700,000 and divide it by three hundred thousand. Right. That means I have thirty-two chances to get the next load in. I can lose thirty-one loads. Right. And still break even. I'll get the last load in, they've still made money. <laughs> That's how ridiculous this number is. Okay. So I've never lost a load. Right. Are any of these loads getting caught? I mean, are any of these guys getting caught in the... Um... Some guys, you know, I mean, they're, and I wrote this in the book. You know, I mean, we weren't the only people. I mean, we weren't the only guys out there doing this. Right. You know, I mean, there were the pot haulers all over the place, you know, and God bless them, man. I mean, you know, it... it, it, it it takes uh, it takes balls to do this kind of thing, you know. Right. But what I do, what I am talking about, you know, within the pages of the book is is how a little town was able to integrate it into a way of life spanning forty years and three generations, and ran the the uh, Caribbean with impunity. <laughs> I mean, they had no idea that this kind of stuff was going on, on those, or, or the or the the sheer volume of which was going on. That's what really kind of blew their mind when they kind of opened up this bit of a Pandora's box, if you will. And these numbers right here are, are just a, you know, are just a small testament to the fact that, you know, who the violence aspect of it. Let's let's put let's bring this this number into the violence aspect of it. People always, you know, I always get, aren't you scared? I mean, weren't you afraid of flying to Columbia or you're, you know, so, you know, right? I, I worked for Noriega three times. Never actually met the man. He sent me a handwritten note one time, but I never actually met the guy. But, you know, you're working with Noriega. You're working with guys in Jamaica and South America, Venezuela, you know, in Panama. Aren't you afraid? And like, pfft, no. You know, for one thing, these people were handed down through family generationally. I'm generational. The kids I grew up with are generational. There's nobody shooting at anybody. I mean, why in the hell would you shoot at somebody that's, Making got, that kind of got money. Got 31 chances to get your shit in, and he's going to get it in. You know, right. you're guaranteed that. So, you know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense for you know anything like that to take place. So everybody's you know like if I if 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 a load ever did get you know for whatever reason lost or the count come up wrong or something like that, just go back and get another one. Right. Well, you I know? I I remember you know I have a buddy Pete. I've met obviously a bunch of guys you know uh, were drug smugglers or manufacturers or distributors, whatever, you know, because obviously what people, people all kind of categorize it into drug dealers. Sure. Well, yeah, but they're not like this guy no. never dealt any drugs. What are you talking about? He's on an indictment with, you know, for, you know, 30 tons. Yeah, but he just moved it. And they're like, well, he's a drug dealer then. No, he's not. He just mm. moved it. You know, right. they don't understand that. But right. the big thing is, and I've talked to guys who have like lost literally like they've lost, you know, a couple million dollars or they've lost, you know, so much product because there was a seizure and it's like, okay, well, aren't you afraid you're going to get killed? And they're always like, well, you know, Pete explained or shoot cartel guy. I've had cartel guys explain to me like, look, I don't want to kill anybody. If you can prove to me that the DEA grabbed the product or that you didn't rip me off, like it got seized, right. you know, like, look, here's the seizure. Here's this, here's what happened. This is the load. And I know that's where my drugs went. That's fine. You can pay me back. Right. You don't have to pay me back right now. You can slowly pay me back. Like I don't want, I don't want to hurt you. I just want my money. It's a business. Right. I want my money. 
the guys that get killed, typically from my understanding, they're like guys that tend to get killed are guys that we know, like you've lost three loads. You're lying. This is like, like you had it at not, I hate to say this, but it's like getting (laughs) stabbed in prison. You don't randomly get stabbed in prison. If you get stabbed in prison, you had it coming. You kind of you you asked for it. <laughs> right. You you were given a chance. Right. You could have checked in. You could have right. get transferred. You could have paid me back. You could Right. You knew this was happening. You see, now it, it, it's interesting that you should bring this up because in the inner workings of the of, of the whole organization, if that's what we choose to call it. Right. Um, we have um, safety protocol built in to our whole network that is designed exactly for that very thing. Now, when I say that, I what I mean by that is there's never, like if, if um, say, Carlito and Leo are my two partners in Miami. I, I only name them as Carlito and Leo. There's hundreds of guys over there wanting to be the guy, right. you know. But I don't want to know any of them freaking people don't bring them don't introduce me bring me the money what do you want i'll bring it to you you deal with it that kind of thing well um carlito and leo would bring me you know so and so's money i would buy the stuff and what would happen is that um if uh, there's two different ways that this this the, the, the deal could go about for me i could do the whole deal I'll go to Colombia, Central America, Jamaica, wherever it is you want your shit because I got a connection. I'll buy whatever much, whatever you want, however much you want. I'll bring it to you and I'll put it on your doorstep at a plaza in Miami for $175 a pound. You want to send your own boat to go get the shit, bring it back here. You want me to offload it, bring it ashore, put it in, bring it to you to Miami. That's $145 a pound. It's the only two ways I've ever done this job. Now, but most of them always opt for the whole, just do it. 175 bucks a pound, I'll just bring it right to you. Well, what happens in that case is if um, I'm sending my boats to South America to get the load, one of their guys is on that boat. One of the owners of the shit is on that boat. He goes to South America. He stands right next to my guy who's counting the bales as they're put on the boat. There's anywhere between 800 and 1,000 pieces can go on a load, depending on the size of the load. They match the count. They run the Caribbean together. They get out here. They offload the boats. They, They go into the truck. They count the bales. Count matches, okay. They go to Miami, they unload the trucks, they unload the cars, they unload the vans. They count each piece. Each piece is counted for. Each piece is counted for. So if there's anything missing, or if that boat gets popped or busted or boarded or anything like that, their guy is on there to tell them exactly what happened. Right. That's how we took care of that. So there was never any question about, you know, loads missing, pieces. Obviously, you're going to miss a piece here and there because, Jesus Christ, you're stacking this shit. I mean... It could be a We did 55 tons off. one night just to see if we could do it. 110,000 pounds, and you, you get a little of this and a little of this, some shit rolls off. Those we call square group, or that's, an, right, that's right. another story. That's a, I was going to say, that's the name of uh, another uh, documentary, right? Yeah, Billy Corbin did a documentary called uh, um, Square Grouper, and it was a, tr- it was a bit of a trilogy. Yeah, and, from, and right. um, it had to do with the Ethiopi- Ethiopian Zion Coptic Church, Brother Love and his group of uh, clowns down in Jamaica. Those guys were great. I love those guys. <laughs> um, and there was the uh, Robert Flathorn, who was the uh, Black Tuna Gang. These guys got their brains together and decided that when uh, Carter was uh, making quasi moves for legalization for marijuana. They were kind of pre-setting themselves up for the industry by way of um, headquarters at the Fountain Blue Hotel downtown in Miami (laughs) and setting up a network to Columbia. And I think their claim to fame was like 500,000 pounds or some shit like that. Um, The the, the Zions, they were like a million pounds of, of Jamaican ganja brought into their mansion on Star Island, which is right in the middle of Biscayne Bay, by the way. That's, Mm -hmm. That's a funny story. Um, and then there was the third part of the trilogy, which was Everglade City. Um, 
all three stories were done fairly fairly well, but when it came to the Everglades City portion of it, they totally missed the story because the Everglades City, um, as far as anybody that knows the history or knows anything about it, is the um, was the pot smuggling hub of North America at that time, and nobody knew it. This is the this is one of the most beautiful things about the story. It's a it's a nonviolent, family oriented. Grew up kids grew up one right after the other, learning how to smuggle without a gun being shot. That's one of the most uh, one of the, one of the most likable things about the story that I'm proud of. Right, as you know, growing up as a kid like that. But um, well, I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt you, no, but no, I mean, no. it's at this point you were you're you're just working on the boat. At some point, you basically take over the operation. Like right. you kind of, ju- we kind of jumped that. Well, what, that we kind of skipped that. We started talking about how you bring in this and you this and you that. But that was like there was a bus that cleaned out a ton of people, and you kind of stepped in. Oh yeah, there were several. Okay, so I'm sorry. Right. That's why. So let's let's so we don't miss that. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Um, like when did that happen? Like you're still you're still working the boat. You're running a, like a crew, right? But you're still working for. The top guys. I'm just a, at what point do they well, get knocked out? When w- when you talk knowledge. about top guy, there really isn't a top guy. There's um, well, there, guys there, there were there were group. brothers who learned from the older guys, and when one of them had a job to do, everybody would work it, and they would work his, and he would work his, and it was kind of a family affair. You yeah. know, I got a job, let's all work, and about, and it was kind of the thing where there was so much work going on that. Um, you know, people were taking turns. You work tonight, and Jimmy, you work tomorrow night, and then Teddy, you work Wednesday night, and then we'll go back and we'll, everybody gets a piece of the action, kind of yeah. a thing. Well, I mean, if there's so look, if there's enough money and everybody doesn't get greedy and they just, are, you know, what I'm saying, then it can, things can work smooth. We were just turned 21, 20, and 21 years old, and we're averaging, Jesus, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars a night. As kids, I mean, this is just what we knew. This, uh-huh. is, this is how we grew up. I remember the uh, the art or the um, news clipping the the that Colby and I watched uh, um, the the nightly news when one of them hit the nightly news and they were talking about they were talking to one of the local people. They're like, well, you know, there was a lot of. A lot of high-priced vehicles. There was a lot of people building a lot of big houses. People are, you know, like, like, like you could just tell, like, there's like a, you know, yeah. you're in this town. You know, even if you have nothing, there's no way you can not know what's going on. But it, even if you pretend, and she's like, you, so what? Right, you can't <laughs> miss all the all the brand new vehicles. All the brand like 22 year, right. 21, 22 year old kids are not driving. Right. You know, Corvettes and 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 brand new, you know, uh, right. trucks and. Well, see, here's here's the, here's an interesting thing about that, which didn't, which isn't what brought the attention to the town in the first place. Not the trucks, not the cars, uh, that sort of thing. Because stone crabbing in and of itself is a very lucrative business, and if you're working and you're busting your ass on the back of one of those boats, I'm I was you know I was making fifteen hundred dollars a week. So, uh, in in some cases, you know, the, the catches were that good. Plus, I'm making a salary, so I could afford to a degree certain things. But you know, when it came to the really you know um, opulent things that you know made a difference, if if that, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, you have all these uh, you know un, unremarkable trailers that people are living in. You know, you drive down the island and you drive in and out of town and stuff like that. But it's when you open the door and walk in is when the difference is made. All the new appliances, all the new carpeting, all the new blinds and shades and, you know, electronics. I mean, this is all inside this raggedy old fucking trailer. But to get to where I got, it was a very, it was a a bit of a serendipitous um, um, adventure where um, we had worked, and I wrote in the book, 28 nights in a row. And to the tune of, and I just did a rough calculation to the tune of some 1.6 million pounds. Um, one night we did 55 tons just, just, just to, to see, see if we could, could, do, it, right? could okay. do it, you know, and then it was a couple nights before that, a couple days before that, see, I would go out and work in the evening because my job was unloading the boats at night. We'd come in, you know, during the day with a catch. We'd catch, we'd, un- we'd unload the freighters and we'd come in the next day with the crabs, you know, kind of a thing. Um, so, uh, um, 
I had just got done with this 55 tons and I figured I'd go over to the house to see how the loading is going on because we load the houses during and bring this stuff in at night and we run it all to Miami during the day, broad daylight. Right. We're unloading this house and we're sending cars and trucks. If they weren't loaded the night before, the vans, the cars, the trucks or whatever it is, and they're driven into town and parked in somebody's driveway and then they're sent at intervals by radio, they're getting loaded the next day and then they're being sent off like that. Well, um, prior, a couple of days prior to this huge load that we decided to do, one of the big bosses, Daryl, hands me and my buddy Jimmy a chainsaw and a wrecking bar and she, points to this brand new Winnebago and says, hey, he said, I want you to go inside there and, and, and tear everything out of that damn thing. Everything from the windows down. Seats, cabinets, you name it, just rip it out of there. So when you look at the thing, you could see the cabinets and the curtains and stuff, but yeah. you got up in there and you can look, there's nothing. There weren't even any drivers or passenger seats in this thing. And we put airbags in the springs and inflated them so the thing wouldn't compress. And they put they put just over 10,000 pounds of bales in this thing and stacked them right up level with the window. And they even took one out like this, pulled it out so that the driver could s sit down in between them and drive the damn thing because there was no seat, right? Right. So me, lucky me, I go over there, see how things are going, and Daryl's standing and goes, hey, Timmy, come here. He goes, uh, uh, I need a favor. I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. And um, he says, um, I need someone that I trust that that could drive this thing to Miami because it can't go to where it, we typically need to take these vehicles. Now, the way it's done is the cars and the vans and the, the you know, um, vehicles of that nature are, are given a particular um, plaza to go to over in Kendall or Coral Gables or someplace like that over in East Miami or West Miami. Right. You pull into this plaza, you get out, you go window shop for a while. There's a, one of our guys is on the other end with the Cuban partners pointing out which vehicles are ours coming into the parking lot. Our guys get out, their guys get in it, go and load it, at the stash house in Miami. Yeah, they take the vehicle, they unload it somewhere, they bring the bring vehicle it back. Down. This is what now the United States government describes as a dead drop. We invented the dead drop. So that had a that had a twofold effect. The guys in Miami didn't know where the shit was coming from in Everglades, and the guys in Everglades didn't know where the shit was going to Miami. So if anybody got nailed, nobody could tell anybody where the shit was at. Right. Because a lot of times the drivers isn't even at the house in Everglades where it's being loaded. He doesn't. He doesn't even own the thing. Drivers don't own the vehicles, and they don't own the boats. Right. There's a reason for that as well. So. Daryl looks at me and he goes, I need somebody to drive this thing over because it's got to go right to the stash house. It can't go to the, you know, the plaza because, I mean, dude, you get within 30 feet of this thing, you can smell it, right? Right. So I re reluctantly, I did it because, you know, I just made 75 grand. I didn't need the cash. 30, 35,000, he said, I'll give you 35 grand. Just drive it over there. Two-hour drive. But I need you to stay over there and spend the day with the guys and drive a car full of money back, you know, right. tonight. So, okay, so I, I drive this behemoth over there to Miami and I spend the day with these guys and, you know, they're paying poker and this and that, just waiting out the day and they give me a, a car, you know, I mean, just jacked full of money. And it's even got airbags in the springs in this car because, I mean, money's heavy, dude, you know this. Um, so to keep the thing from sparking the highway, we've got airbags in this car full of money, so I drive this thing back. So consequently, I got to meet the Cuban crew that nobody ever met except the adults, the grown-ups. Right. Because the, the bail handlers and the drivers and that stuff never had to have to go to that house. They always went to the dead drop. Nobody ever met anybody. So I met this guy named Jorge and his buddy. So in 1983, the United States government rounds up over 250 federal agents from every branch of law enforcement under the United States Treasury comes down to Everglades City in Naples and locks down everything. And they start affecting arrests. But we're, but you're not there. Well, everybody's there at this time. Oh, okay. This is like 2 in the morning. I okay. thought you had gone to Miami. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping were, forward. Was, okay, I thought you were in Miami. It's in, no. you know. I've, I've met the Cuban guys now, okay? 
everybody's fixing to get busted. So Operation Everglades comes to town maybe four or five months later, right. six months later. Well, how do they how do they get even get onto it? I'm just wondering, was it a... Well, at that time, they had had somebody moved into Everglades City for two years. Oh, okay. They had an inside guy they the whole there for two for, years? For two years it took Okay. Them. Because this is, I mean, we're talking about tight-knit shit going on here. Well, uh, the intelligence of the first and second generations at that time was as such that they knew a week before they were coming and that they were, were coming. So when they, all these fellow agents showed up on the island, nobody was around. <laughs> it, was a, it was a clown show, really. Right. Um, they got a several people, a few, uh, you know, a few cars and stuff like that. But it wasn't the significant, um, you know, bust that they thought it was going to be. So almost a year to the day, they came back again. Operation Everglades 2. This time, everybody knew it was happening. Everybody knew it was coming, and the, the older generations were pretty much just sat out on the front porches in the middle of the night, smoked cigarettes, waiting for the show to start. <laughs> and here they come, another nearly 300 agents from every, I'm talking about CIA, FBI, FDLE, um, DEA, Customs, you name it, they were there. Um, this time, they did pretty good because everybody kind of waited on them. You know, they, 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 they got the, the older generations of guys that they wanted. Some guys, they had to kind of wait for self-surrender and the same, that sort of thing. But there were just so many of them that at this time, that's when Life Magazine shows up to, to do their article. And um, it was a bit comical because the article, they were talking about, um, you know, this, this small town... If I can just show it to the yeah yeah, yeah. this small town in Everglades, tarred with drug smuggling. If I can get to it. Plus, here. if you if you want, Colby, you can also put the picture because it's actually online. Like that, this picture he's showing, yeah, it's actually online because I've already uh, I found it. I you'll see it when it's and it's got it's got Harrison Ford on the front cover. Yeah, you know. Yeah, this one. That's that's this. This issue, but here is an overview of the Ten Thousand Islands, and it says, "Yeah, everybody." A South Florida town uh, tarred with drug smuggling, and most of its six hundred residents say, "So what?" <laughs> Trouble in Everglades City, and um, these are a lot of my a lot of my buddies getting get arrested, going to prison here. But um, that was the second operation. That was in 1984. That was that was when they they did some significant damage as far as you know getting the people that they wanted to get. But what they didn't understand at the time was the scope. The kids, we were the, we were doing all the work. The right. adults were just pointing, and going here, move this, move this, move that load, move this load. All the kids. When was this? This what year? was in '84. You said they came in 80. Oh, okay. You're, never mind. They came two I, years in a row. Right. They came in 83. Then a year later, they came in 84. And, but that year, they actually grabbed some people. Yeah. And there were more reporters on the island than there were being people being arrested at that yeah. time. Yeah. We were, we were we mentioned earlier, we saw all the, just the one, one, you know, and, you know, for anybody watching, like this is back when there was, there were three major networks and you typically had like a local station. Right. And, and there was, and there's there articles. Like, like Dan Rather and... Um, um, who, I forget. It's who funny too because I like everybody's so young. In, in the yeah. when I was we were watching it, I, I'm I know Colby probably didn't recognize all these guys, but I'm like, oh, wow, look how young these guys are. <laughs> like there was one guy that was on there that's that Peter Jennings went on to be like on like sixty minutes or twenty twenty or something, right. and was there till he was in his seventies, and then and now he's not even around anymore. And I looked at him and I was like. He look, he's so young in right. this. But yeah, they had all these all the reporters there talking about yeah. how they were grabbing everybody and Mark Potter, he was one of their reporters. And and they yeah. were interviewing people. They interviewed a the city councilman who was yeah. like who was like, look, these that guys was, have that done. That was Butler. Yeah, these guys have done like this, this is these he's, guys have contributed to this entire community. He's like <gasps> Right. <sighs> and then they interviewed a couple other people from the town who were like who were saying the same thing. They said, Look, these guys aren't the one woman said, "said These guys aren't. We're there's, not, there's no violence. We're not there's hurting no, anybody. We're not hurting anybody. There's no violence. Nobody's getting killed. This isn't like this isn't Miami. This isn't kind of like Cocaine Cowboys where they're 
they got Griselda Blanco and they're they're executing guys in the street. Right. Like this is marijuana right. and they're all working together and the that, whole town's built on that. That was actually one of the reasons why I felt it was necessary to write this book the way I wrote it. And I actually had, you know, gone down prior to the, you know, to putting pen to paper and interviewing and, and letting people know once they heard that, the, that I was going to write this book, they decided that, you know, if someone's going to write this, it should be somebody that was there, first of all, right. somebody that actually knows what took place. And we wouldn't be willing to allow 30, 40 years from now, some journalist or some, you know, historian to patch quilt together a story that they think took place. Right. This is actually how it took place. It's, it's funny. You're saying, um, just that everything you're, you're saying, like prior to going to prison, prior to interviewing all the you know different drug smugglers and, and, and distributors and guys that I've you know interviewed, like everything you're saying, like of course you're, what you're saying is in the U, the uh, the RV, which is different. Because these, because I know guys that were like they would drive, they would drive in with a vehicle with you know three hundred pounds in the trunk, and then they they leave the keys and they would just walk off, and then somebody else would you know in a motel parking lot would walk in, grab the keys, get in the thing, right. and you actually have the option of saying when they got grabbed, like they don't know what's in the trunk. Right. I was told to come here and drop the car off and walk away. So, but yeah, you don't have that chance. You've got how many? You know, you're, not, ton, ton. you're not getting away from that. No, not from an RV. <laughs> but same thing. But I know multiple guys who that's you know that's the the dead drop. That's the drop the car, yes. walk away, and five hours or even the next day they'll bring it back and it's crisp and clean. You get or the they and leave. or they keep the car. Um, I had know. one guy, this guy right here, actually. This guy's name is Mike Hudson. His mother drove a a an RV, I want to say it was filled with marijuana. It may have been, they may have been importing Coke at that time, but cause at one point they had started with marijuana, but just like most people in Miami, they right. moved to Coke. Uh, it was started with marijuana. It became Coke. But at one point they stacked an entire RV filled with it. Same, just like you were saying, filled up. He's like, he's like, literally they couldn't go in the back. They had the curtains drawn. Right. It was all the way and uh, had driven it across country or something, same RV. But I mean, like everything you're saying, like completely, like I've got bits and pieces, but nothing at the scope of what you're talking about or right. the, with those numbers. It's always right. much more. And even their numbers are outrageous. Right. So the, you know, their, their numbers are outrageous and their numbers are, are minuscule compared to your numbers. So anyway, I'm just, I thought. In the scheme of things, it's all relative, really. Yeah, well, they didn't have a whole town. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, I helping, didn't have a whole know, town doing it. You know, there's a lot. the other way. <laughs> yeah.